yesterday we talked about challenging everybody a bit. And today is a lot about that. This morning you're going to hear about that. Um, this afternoon, we've got a really special session in the afternoon. Our committee talked at length about it, what we could do. Will, where's, is Will in, I think, yeah, Will's right here. He's going to speak a little bit and cue it up this morning. But uh, with the NAFP, the Softwood Lumber Board has been a huge partner and really helped us and, and Think Wood and all these incredible partners. But you're going to hear from Will and we're going to talk, um, talk about that. And uh, we're just excited to have Will here and, uh, and being presenting and talking about what it's Forest Proud, but there's a great name. Hashtag Forest Proud, right? I, th I called it at. I thought that was what it meant, but it's hashtag now. That's cool. So the other thing that's exciting, and you'll hear from uh, Mayor Ted in a bit, but we're going to be in Portland next year, right here about the same time. So give it up for this convention center. 2020 is, is being decided, and we're looking for input on that, but, you know, and we're going to decide that in the next 90 days, but um, we're open for input, but we're here next March 2019, and it's going to be bigger and better, and we've already got a lineup of folks coming, so, um, but we're, we'd welcome you to any suggestions. So with that, Bill, are you ready to come on up? We're going to bring Bill Parsons with our uh, uh, heading up the Woodworks team, which is a great partner of ours and is doing some incredible things, so bring it up for uh, Bill Parsons. Thanks, Bill. All right, good morning. Seems like we've lost a few people. I don't know what that's about, conference. All right, well, thanks, thanks for having me. And I wanted to share a few thoughts around kind of reflecting on, on day one and a little bit more around woodworks and kind of other things going on throughout the rest of the year um, with you all this morning. So, you know, yesterday I chatted quite a bit around, you know, let's build some projects. So I think you guys, I, we had a lot of chatter. I know for a fact we had some plans in, the, in, our, um, in our booth, put in a couple extra stories of, wo of wood on top of an old, old building, so that was a great project we were helping out on. Um, but, you know, let's continue this momentum today, especially after everyone kind of wakes up and wraps up what they were doing yesterday. So, so Woodworks, you know, we're focused on two things, um, project support and education. So this morning I want to talk a little bit around how we do our education, what other educational events we have kind of coming up. So maybe as a show of hands, how many people have somebody in mind that they wish was here, that they wish they have? I, I know somebody that could really, should be here. Anybody have somebody in mind that they think, yes, they should be here? So hold, we'll come back to that in a minute here. Um, so, before I start off, you know, yesterday we talked at length a little bit around what Woodworks, um, our funding partners, Softwood Lumber Board, um, US, the U.S. Forest Service, and FII, our main funders, also want to recognize our national partners. Pretty much, you know, many of these uh, folks, if not all of them, have a booth down in the exhibit hall, but they also help Woodworks um, at all of our events throughout the country. Um, both from a speaking perspective and a, an exhibiting at our events. So these companies help Woodworks grow the overall wood market. So I'd like to thank them as well um, because without this support, we couldn't do what we do. And one of the main things that, that we're doing is education events. Valerie actually mentioned their stats from, 20, um, from last year, from 2017. For 2018, we're gonna, it looks like we'll have 266 branded events and then additional uh, trade shows and other things we'll do, and this will target about 35 hours, or 35,000 hours of education. And how that kind of breaks down over the year is that Woodworks has a major event in you know, one, a month, one a month basically for the rest of the year till November. So those major events are a full day uh, education session we call Wood Solution Fair, or a Wood Design Symposium, another full day event. 
and our wood design symposiums actually are focused on mass timber, and wood solution fairs have a track of um, mass timber education. So those people that you raised your hand that you were thinking of that need to be here can also be at one of these big bubbles because you're all from somewhere close to one of these, I would guess. And, you know, look at the, where you're at, jot down what month that's happening in, and look for the Woodworks information around that event because we've got, we're taking this mass timber content and a lot of the same, a lot of the same speakers, a lot of um, what, you, uh, what you've seen here and learn here, you can learn locally. It can be in your, in your area. Bring out people that maybe couldn't make it to the conference, couldn't dedicate a whole, whole week to this or several days. If they can get there for, a, for one day, you know, please come out. We'd, we'd love to share this knowledge with we have, with what we have around mass timber and, and all wood products, really. It's kind of a, the, uh, the wood solution fairs definitely have a mix of mid-rise and mass timber and everything wood buildings. So go, come check those, those out. Um, one other thing that I want to mention around education is that also we didn't really highlight it much yesterday, but track three has uh, Woodworks is, is doing the CEUs for those. So um, if you want continuing edu education credit uh, for things at this conference in track three, there's, a, there's information around how to get those credits both from AIA and also from ICC. So check that out here at this conference. Our final, the final point I want to make is just around something that, that's kind of new for us and around one, one thing you'll hear over and over again is, okay, it's great, we can design it, but when it comes to the cost and actually execution, people really are asking, okay, how do I, what do I do next? How do, you know, it gets shot down because no one knows how to build it and there's lots of layers of cost that get put in at that um, installation side. So we are working towards coordinating the industry effort around installation training. We have a, a group of people pulled together that we are, we are building installation, kind of a workshop, and then using that as a model then that anybody can use. And we're gonna run several demos of this in the fall is the plan, and then after that, we'll be doing them kind of on a quarterly basis and then providing those materials after the refine to anybody who wants to deliver installation training. So we can have more people building out of mass timber and better quotes and the whole thing will continue to grow. That's, that's one thing that Woodworks will do and it will also tie to the expertise program that I talked about a little bit yesterday that on our website we're going to have some better lists around who's built a project, what skills do people have, what's happening, what education have they taken and this will be kind of a wrapped into there with their installation training. So that's, that's kind of what we are about, you know, we'd love to help you on your projects like I talked about yesterday and please come to one of our other events throughout the country. Bring your friends. Let's help you know, keep, keep getting this bigger. So thank you very much. Have a great day in the conference. And we'll chat with you later. Thank you, Bill. My name is Tom Waddell. I'm with uh, Forest Business Network, and I'm the event manager for this uh, event. And uh, as I said yesterday, for many of you who joined us, um, uh, on Wednesday, um, I really very much enjoy working with many of you. I know I get to talk to you with e on email and on the phone, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to work on this event. Now, I work with Craig and Arnie from Forest Business Network, and then Bill Parsons and Jennifer and their vast, extensive team from Woodworks, uh, and we get to work for about seven or eight months to put this event together. And uh, like I said, it's a, it's a great joy for us. So thank you for joining us today. Now, many of you got to eat breakfast here in this other room this morning. Um, keep in mind if uh, I know uh, some of you are here just for the day, we will have lunch and the breaks actually downstairs in the exhibit hall. So you won't be going into this room, you're gonna be downstairs in the exhibit hall, very close to where the educational panels are. Now, if you have any questions, if you have any needs, I know many of you are trying to uh, check in on your flights that are going out this evening or anything like that. We should be able to help you down at the registration desk. We usually have a computer, an extra computer, if you need some help there. Um, and uh, please do ask us questions and we'll do our best to guide you and get you out the door safely. Now, I'd like to take just a little bit uh, to thank 
two very special groups today. Um, for those who had, who, who had the opportunity to, uh, to come uh, yesterday, you heard me talk about our committee. Uh, we have a steering committee that's usually made up of anywhere from seven to 10 people. It could possibly get larger as we go on. But I thought I might take just a little bit of time to explain what this committee does. Now, when we recruit re committee members, we're asking them to meet once a month, and they, we get on a conference call, and we spend about an hour, usually it extends quite a bit past that, usually an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. But we're in, uh, basically putting a little bit of discovery in and trying to decide what we're gonna do as far as themes for each of the tracks and what are the most pressing questions of the day for mass timber, manufacturing, development, building, and so on and so forth. It's quite a bit of work. Um, you know, uh, our committee members are very professional. They have, a lot, they have a lot of expertise. And what we found is that they, they don't come in and just sit around on us. They, they come into work and they, they, wanna, they wanna put their, uh, their mark on this event. So if you're enjoying the content that you're seeing here today, it is, it is because of them. And they're extremely hardworking. They have regular day jobs outside of this conference. And sometimes, you know, uh, Arnie and Craig and I especially, uh, and I know Bill, Bill's part of our committee, Bill from Woodworks, it's easy to think that they work just for us because they work that hard on this event. And we very much appreciate them and I wanted to just introduce them here a little bit. Uh, I won't bring them up on stage and make them go through all that again today, but uh, I thought I'd let you at least know who they are and we can give them a big round of applause. So our first committee member in order of, uh, of um, uh, alphabetical order is Ember Bishop Bentley from the Georgia Forestry Foundation. I know uh, I talked to Ember yesterday and uh, she's been able to bring some key folks from Georgia and really trying to push mass timber in that, uh, in that state, and we really appreciate her and all her efforts. Brian Brashaw of the uh, U.S. Forest Products Lab. Um, Brian's been involved with Forest Business Network on some level for many, many years, long before the Mass Timber Conference, and he's really been a, a great friend and colleague and ally of ours. Oscar Farrow uh, who, of uh, Oscar Farrow and Associates. Uh, Oscar has been with us. Um, Oscar, I can't even remember. I think you're a three-time committee member with us. Um, just been a fantastic ally for us and uh, uh, brought in that initial expertise we needed when we first started this event to really add a lot of credibility to our, our, uh, our uh, educational panels. Pat Layton of Clemson University. Pat's a multi-year committee member for us, and uh, as, a, as a Southerner myself from Georgia, I was thrilled to death to get Pat on the committee uh, when we did, and uh, she's, uh, she's giving me my Southern roots, and, uh, and they're doing a lot of fantastic research in Southern Yellow Pine and CLT and lots of other things in, involving mass timber at Clemson. And I think uh, Pat was successful in bringing quite a few Clemson students as well to the event. Tim Locke of, uh, of the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Uh, Tim has been with us for multiple years, ever since the beginning of this conference, and he's our, our man on the ground, as I like to call him here in Portland. He is instrumental in making sure that our tours actually take place. He's going out and he's meeting with the building owners and architects whenever a new uh, mass timber building comes up around this area. And uh, we really honestly could not do these tours without him and he provide, also provides considerable input uh, in our meetings each month. Ian McDonald of the Tallwood Design Institute. Uh, Ian's been with us for multiple years now. Um, he's been a, 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 a fantastic guy, especially uh, uh, to tap into his knowledge. He was coming out of, uh, I believe it was Vancouver, uh, and has a lot of uh, uh, both Canadian experience and, and U.S. experience to uh, and input on mass timber that we can use for these, uh, for these panels each day. Nick Milestone of the William Hare Group. 
uh, really fortunate and lucky to get Nick. Uh, he had to wake up usually around three or four in the morning, uh, sometimes one in the morning to get onto our conference calls because he was calling from Singapore at the time. Uh, so uh, Nick's been a, a, a fantastic part of our committee. Bill Parsons, of course, you just met Bill. He came on the stage, he's with Woodworks. Um, Bill, we've been working with Woodworks for multiple years now. And uh, to be quite honest, uh, you know, our track three content is completely produced by them. And they provide the AIA credits and all the accreditation for those panel or those sessions. Uh, and, and Bill's been fantastic to work with. His team, are, they're on top of things. They're always quick to answer us. And uh, we honestly could not uh, do this conference without these folks. We really appreciate them. Erica Spiritos of uh, Structure Lamb. Uh, Erica came on for the first time this year. Uh, she provided a lot of great ideas and we very much appreciated her input. It was, um, uh, and we actually kind of reconfigured our educational panels based on some ideas that she had, so we really appreciate her. And then Jeff Spiritos, who's a multi-year committee member with us. Uh, uh, he's, out of, he's with Spiritos Properties out of New York. Um, Jeff's this uh, amazing individual who's just been a kind of a, a bulldog for us and he's out there um, constantly refining our content and uh, like all of our committee members um, is never really uh, satisfied with just mediocre. He has to have these, uh, these panels and he has to have the content uh, up to his very high level standards and um, that's why we appreciate this committee so much. Uh, could we give a big round of applause to our committee members? Now, the second group uh, uh, that I'd like to thank today is our sponsors, and we had a, a considerable outpouring of support this year. Uh, very grateful for our sponsors. Many of them have been with us for multiple years. I'd like to start with Katera. Uh, Katera came on, actually, this is their first year sponsoring the uh, Mass Timber Conference. And uh, their support has been considerable. I know we have probably 45 team members from Katera all from around the country here. Um, Katera sponsored our um, welcome reception, which was on Tuesday night. And if you all were here yesterday, they gave away a really cool drone. Uh, so uh, we had one lucky winner here from Portland that got that drone. Uh, but really appreciate Katera. They're our premier sponsor, and uh, their, their support has been incredible for this year. And uh, if you didn't get to hear uh, Michael Mark's presentation yesterday, it was pretty fantastic. And uh, do be sure to stop by their booth and, and find out how they're disrupting an already disruptive industry. Hexion is our, uh, uh, they're our gold sponsor. And Hexion has been with us since 2016, our very first year with the Mass Timber Conference. Hexion uh, was the very first major sponsor we had uh, for the Mass Timber Conference. They believed in what we were doing and they said, sign us up, how can we help? And they always bring a considerable amount of team members here. They're fantastic to work with. Uh, if you haven't stopped by their booth, please do. They're fantastic guys. D.R. Johnson Wood Innovations, uh, um, Valerie and her team have, have been with us since day one. And they came in this year as actually as a multiple uh, sponsor. They're sponsoring uh, not only the tour number two, which we had on Tuesday, but they're sponsoring uh, track two as well and uh, educational panels. So thank you to Valerie and her team. Thinkwood, uh, Thinkwood has been uh, uh, an ally of ours for multiple years, uh, uh, either as sponsors or providing uh, help and input as we needed it. Uh, this year, they're a triple sponsor. They're sponsoring our videos. Uh, they're sponsoring our poster presentations. And then they also came in as a, um, actually, I'm starting, my, my mind's going blank here. Bear with me here. And they sponsored our event program too. You'll see their advertisement on the back. Um, please do look at their, um, their research library. Uh, they've got a big banner hanging in the exhibit hall, but you can see their advertisement on the back of the event program and give you more information. Be sure to visit that, uh, that web page. 
Frere's lumber, uh, their mass plywood panels. You all have seen uh, their gigantic sculpture in the middle of the uh, exhibit hall. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, really enjoyed work working with Tyler and his crew. Uh, many of you who went on tour number two got to actually see their manufacturing plant. They're, they're building the uh, first ever mass plywood panels. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting uh, addition to what is already an exciting uh, industry uh, that we have uh, kicking off here in North America and around the world. Seagate Structures. Uh, Seagate, this is their first year sponsoring with us. They're uh, sponsoring um, Track One. Um, and I forgot to mention, actually, Frere's is tr uh, sponsoring uh, uh, Track Four. I'm sorry. No, take that back. They're our lounge sponsor. But anyway, Seagate is coming in as a, 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 an educational panel sponsor, and we really appreciate those folks. Sanson, this is their first year with us as a sponsor, and they're sponsoring track three. That's the track that uh, Bill and the Woodworks team are heading up. Thank you very much to the Sanson team. Smart Lamb. Uh, Smart Lamb is our uh, track four sponsor, and uh, uh, we've been working with the Smart Lamb crew. Uh, you know, uh, Forest Business Network is based out of Montana. I actually live in Portland, Oregon, but our, most of our team is in uh, Missoula, Montana. Smart Lamb's out of uh, uh, just north of uh, Missoula, and uh, they've been fantastic partners, and uh, we do a lot of things with them in addition to some extra mass timber events in the state of Montana. And, Really appreciated them uh, coming on as our, our, uh, one of our sponsors, and this is actually their second year. Sterling, this is their first year as a, as a sponsor with us, and they're uh, sponsoring our lanyards, which I'm wearing right now. Thank you very much to the Sterling crew. Tallwood Design Institute, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Ian McDonald, uh, uh, who heads up the Tallwood Design Institute, is on our committee. Uh, they've been uh, a, an event bag sponsor with us. This is our second year, so very much appreciate them and all that they're doing. <coughs> Styles uh, is, uh, is with us this year as a sponsor. Very much appreciate uh, uh, everything they've been doing with us. I've gotten to talk with them uh, quite a bit as we planned out this event. Uh, they came on as a tour, uh, uh, a tour sponsor with us this year. Uh, and uh, actually they were a part of the tour number two where we went and visited the Frere's lumber plant and then they were also uh, there to, to speak about some of the machinery and equipment they had there at the, that operation. And then the Oregon, Oregon Forest Resources Institute. I mentioned Tim Locke and all that he does for us on the ground here in Portland. Uh, they've been a fantastic allies ever since day one and uh, uh, really appreciate their team and all that they do for us in this conference and its content. That, uh, that's our list of sponsors. We much, that, these are our major sponsors. We have many other smaller sponsors throughout this event. Uh, you've seen some of their logos on the exhibit hall floor. You see some of their banners around the exhibit hall. And so we have a lot of support at this event. We appreciate everyone. And could we give a big round of applause for all of our sponsors? And one more thing. I think the guys, they switched it on me. Never mind. Uh, we are going to have a prize drawing here. Now, uh, for those who came to our reception last night, uh, Hexion allowed you to enter in your business card for a chance to win two really cool prizes. We gave away the drone yesterday that was sponsored by Katera. Today we're going to give away a, another drone and another really cool Yeti cooler that we Oh, uh, the Yeti cooler was already drawn and, and it's it. Debbie Didier's name was on it, which is really good because Absolutely. then I won't get divorced over Absolutely getting a Yeti no cooler. Absolutely no conflict of interest yeah, there yeah. whatsoever. So. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Tom really works his butt off and gives a lot of effort to this thing. <clears throat> Does a great job. So one thing I would mention that maybe we didn't mention before, but a lot of people were asking, boy, I want to go to this track and I want to go to this track. We are 
professionally videoing everything this time. It'll take uh, you know time to edit it down, but that'll be accessible to everybody. It's really important. Again, like what Tom was saying, we're looking for input. You know, Bill's team and our team. We we want to make this better. We love the regional conferences. We need to to spread the knowledge across the country um, to really take advantage of that. So, but I, I get the pleasure of. Uh, Bring it up, I'll call him just Mayor Ted, as I like to, it's, so it takes a tremendous amount of political will to do a lot of work in some towns. And the mayor has been a staunch supporter of wood products, particularly mass timber. And we're just thrilled he's here. The other thing that I think is cool, because it's near and dear to my heart, is he's an Eagle Scout. It's one of the things you can do as a teenager or a, uh, our daughters were in, in, in Girl Scouts and Gold Award members, and uh, it just sets a nice precedence. But we're really happy to have Mayor Ted, and he's going to talk to you guys about Thanks, Art. Portland. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Arnie, and I guess I should be thanking Debbie perhaps more than anybody else. Uh, thanks for being here today, and welcome to the third annual International Mass Timber Conference, and welcome all of you to Portland, Oregon. As Arnie just said, I am Mayor Ted Wheeler, and I'm fortunate enough to call myself the mayor of this incredible city. So today I was asked to talk a little bit about our state's history, in particular our connections to timber, and what I see as being the science-based opportunities for a sustainable future for our forest products industry. And as you can imagine, I'm not an expert on this subject, and part of the excitement of being the mayor of a city is you get to talk to large groups of people who are experts on the subject. And so what I hope to do today is connect our history and our ethos with some of the great data-driven and science-based technologies and innovations that you are creating that I think bode extremely well for the timber industry in the years ahead. So hopefully while you're here, Arnie isn't working you too hard. I hope you're having a chance to get out of the convention center and you'll see that we're known for many great things in this community. We're known for our coffee and we're known for our donuts. We are certainly known for our arts and culture. We're known for our sustainability and our interest and concern for the environment. And uh, these are all important things. But when you talk to people today, you're going to hear a lot about livability. If you talk to Portlanders, they'll talk about the, the, the proximity to nature. They'll talk about air quality. They'll talk about water quality. They'll talk about the importance of livability. And the truth is, this is sort of one of Portland's dirty little secrets, we have not always scored very high on the measures of livability. We started our experience after the arrival of the American pioneers as a truly rough and tumble timber town. We're located at the confluence of two major waterways, the Willamette River and the Columbia River. And as you can imagine, these waterways provided for the transportation of goods, and the timber industry played a very significant role in our early economy. In fact, long before Portland was Portland, an early nickname for our town was Stump Town, just by virtue of the fact that there was so much clear-cutting going on in order to make way for the development. So, we're very proud of our heritage here. And as I was thinking about the challenge of talking about history and its link to the industry and its connections to the future of the industry, I decided rather than just giving you a textbook walk down memory lane, I'd personalize this a lot. Because we all have our stories and we're all proud 
of those stories. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that. But think about the heritage that we have here, of which we're justifiably proud. We're a people born of a pioneering spirit, and therefore a place born of a pioneering spirit. We have an independence that was born to the rugged frontier. We have a sense of practicality that was born out of necessity. And we have a vision for our future as a state and as a community that in many ways causes us to do things differently. We all, as I say, have our stories. And uh, mine is not terribly unique, as it turns out, in this community. But I like talking about it anyway, so I'll share it with you. My great, great, great grandfather came to Oregon as part of the Great Migration. He arrived here in 1852 from the Oregon Trail, and he came with his 21-year-old son. His son's name was John Kearns. He was a school teacher. They came here together, and they arrived from Indiana, and they didn't know anything about how to start life here in the state of Oregon. But one thing that was very, very clear, we know from the historical record, they saw Oregon as a land nearly boundless with economic opportunity. But it's very clear as I read through John's journal, and I do that from time to time, he and his father understood that that opportunity could not be realized without a lot of hard work, without sacrifice, or without taking risk. Why do I mention this? I mention this because as I think about that crossroads at which they found themselves arriving after a multi-month journey across the continent to a small community on the frontier that they knew very little about, they saw that opportunity. Your industry, I believe, is at that crossroads of opportunity. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Trust me, this is going somewhere. This is why we're all here today. So continuing the story, John, the logger, formerly a grade school teacher, did what a lot of young men did back then. There weren't a lot of jobs here. Uh, so uh, the great opportunity was in logging. And if you think that logging was dangerous in recent years, imagine what it was, would have been like in the 1850s. We know that shortly after he arrived here, he was still a young man, so it's probably sometime around 1870, he died in a logging accident. And he was one of many, of course, who did. Fast forward a couple of generations, because timber was now in our blood. It was in the DNA of our family, and lots of people in this family had participated in the growth and the development of the timber industry in Oregon. Along came my grandfather. His name was Coleman Wheeler, and he started his career in the same way that John had a couple of generations earlier as a logger. But over the course of his career, things had changed. And his career was defined very much by what we all describe today as being the American dream. Over the course of decades, he rose from being a logger to being the chairman of the board of one of the nation's largest forest products companies. Some of you may remember it. It was called Willamette Industries and it was based right here in Portland, Oregon, and it employed thousands of people. I still remember Coleman Wheeler. I was just a kid. I was still in the Scouts. I was probably a tenderfoot. But I remember thinking of him as a larger-than-life force of nature. He was a very formidable person, and he had a very tough personality. And I know that in the industry, he was respected. But I saw a side of him that a lot of people never saw. 
I knew that he was a very compassionate man. And I still remember one day we were driving through downtown Portland and he pulled his car over to the side of the road and looking at a group of homeless men, he said, my God, I wish we could do more for those people. I still remember this almost 50 years later. Why do I mention that? Because I don't think people appreciate that the timber industry then, as part of its ethos, was concerned about and integrated into the fundamental fabric of the community. And I want to share this with you. It's important because I know you come from all over the country and all over the world. And I know the timber industry has been under a lot of fire for many, many years. But in this community, the timber industry was integral in terms of building maybe many of our philanthropic institutions in this state, like the Oregon Community Foundation. And it was critical in terms of building cultural institutions in this state, like the World Forestry Center. And just as my grandfather had a compassionate side that so few people ever had the opportunity to see, so too does the industry have a compassionate side. And it helps to build institutions and organizations that help people struggle, like the DePaul Treatment Center. They gave back a lot more than they got my grandfather and his peers in the industry. And while all of those big headquarters institutions moved out of the state through the development and the evolution of the industry, the ethos that they created in this state and in this community has never left. And that's important because it is a foundation upon which the future of the timber industry will be built in this city and in this state. By 1940, Oregon had become the premier timber state in the entire union. And the success of our industry continued unabated all the way through the 1970s. At that time, by the late 1970s, the timber industry in Oregon employed over 70,000 people, and they paid 30% above the state average wage. 70,000 people, 30% above the state average wage. You can see how important this was to our economic structure. Today, we only have about 25 thousand jobs in the industry in this state that pay at the state average. What happened? So Josh Lenner of the Oregon Office of Economic Development, sorry, Economic Analysis, has done some really interesting analysis in this area. And I encourage all of you at some point when you have a free moment, given your ties to this industry to look at that information because it's very telling and it gives us a lot of clues and ideas about some of the challenges we're going to experience moving the industry forward. But he did all of this analysis on the transformation of the industry. The industry you know, globally took a hit during the 1980s as a result of the recession. And when the industry emerged from that recession, you all know it was significantly and fundamentally changed. Increased productivity and efficiencies, which were a good thing, meant production remained strong, but it had a huge impact on reducing employment across the industry. According to the Oregon Department of Economic Analysis, technology advances more automation, and less labor-intensive manufacturing processes all conspired to reduce opportunities for employment despite the fact that there was a significant ramp up in total lumber production. The other key factor in changing the Oregon timber industry was the implementation of new federal land restrictions. 
Some of you come from states like ours, where much of the available resource is federally controlled. That is true here in the state of Oregon. And timber production on federal lands has fallen precipitously over the last 30 years, even as production on private lands has remained relatively stable. This balancing act between advancing technology and increased regulation is not a new factor. It's been in the industry for a long time, and it is an obstacle, or maybe put better in a more optimistic light, a challenge that needs to be addressed going forward. In the 1920s, logging with oxen was on the way out. Technology was increasing, making it easier and more cost effective to cut large swaths of trees, the technology. I don't think it's a coincidence that the invention of the commercial chainsaw in 1935 was followed almost immediately by policies and ideas, for example, the implementation of sustained yield harvest only two years later. Again, the technology and the regulatory ideas went hand in hand. Technological innovation combined with increased environmental awareness is the key to understanding the economic history of the industry. And it is also the key, I believe, and this is sort of my topic sentence, the key to understanding the opportunities for the future in this industry as well. As I reviewed the list of panels for this conference, it's very clear that the Forest Products Society is well aware of the need for future-based thinking in this industry. You've compiled a list of topics and panelists that know far more than I will ever know on some of these subjects. I don't claim any particular expertise in models of calculation for mass timber construction or monetizing bio-based carbon in urban buildings or the specifics of redesigning sawmills for mass timber production. But I do want to talk about one area of innovation in our state that has our leaders in this state not just in politics, but also in industry, talking. And that's, of course, large-scale construction utilizing mass timber products such as cross-laminated timber, or CLT. You usually hear elected officials, like myself, talking about education or health care or public safety. Manufactured wood products, at least in Portland, I'll just tell you, it doesn't even make the list. I can go to a two-hour community forum and nobody's ever going to raise this subject, ever. And I've been mayor now for 14 months and it's never happened yet. But CLT is on the lips of virtually every single elected official in this state, and perhaps more in Portland, Oregon, than even in rural Oregon. CLT, and I assume most everybody here knows this, is manufactured wood product. It's said to be as strong as conventional materials and more environmentally sound because wood is a renewable, air, is a renewable resource and because it has a lower carbon footprint. This is a technology innovation that has been in use in commercial construction in many European countries and in Canada for many, many years. And now, of course, it's made its way right here to the United States. What has everybody so excited here in Oregon is that a lumber mill in Riddle, Oregon, and they're one of your sponsors, D.R. Johnson, is the first in the country to manufacture building-ready CLT panels. Oregon Best, which is an organization here in the state of Oregon that seeks to grow technology innovation, awarded D.R. Johnson a $150,000 grant to further develop CLT, which they have, and they also hosted a CLT design competition with an award of up to $200,000 for the winner. 
And Oregon Governor Kate Brown recently announced a $350,000 investment in making Oregon a key player in cross-laminated timber. To show its impact, again, this is data-based, this is science-based, a thorough economic analysis was performed by Oregon Best and several collaborative partners to evaluate the potential of CLT in Oregon and Southwest Washington. The findings estimate that the industry, just CLT in Oregon, could range anywhere from 338 million to over a billion dollars annually. And it could create up to 17,000 300 jobs in the state. So the promise of CLT is significant. Remember, we're only at 25,000 people and all of a sudden we're talking about one technology increasing that by another potential 17,300 people and potentially adding as much as a billion dollars of value into the timber industry just here. I'm proud to tell you that the city of Portland approved funding for a new development called Framework, which will go up in our city, in the Pearl District neighborhood in Northwest Portland. Framework will be the first high-rise structure in the US made from wood, built with CLT, in addition to being an innovative, earthquake-resilient building. This new technology has the promise of allowing us to build taller and faster in a way that is both seismically safe, which is important because we are in an earthquake zone, and, and environmentally uh, sustainable. The development demonstrates how smart funding decisions can leverage federal, state, regional, and philanthropic resources to produce affordable housing units and economic development opportunities. Framework is an innovative demonstration project that plans to utilize over 50% of its wood from regionally harvested timber and or manufacturing in rural Oregon communities like Riddle and will be a demand catalyst for mass timber production all throughout the United States. The goal is to demonstrate a path for creation of tall wood buildings in America, thereby unlocking the demand for new timber and manufacturing jobs and investment in mass timber production. Furthermore, we put our own little Portland twist on this. The housing units in the framework building are intended to be affordable for 99 years, made possible in part by upfront investments in quality materials and sustainable technology. So we have suddenly taken a timber innovation and we've put it right in the heart of Portland, Oregon, which is a community, as I said, with an ethos around environmental protection and sustainability, and we have made it uniquely about the needs of Portland in terms of sustainability, environmental resilience, earthquake resilience, and concern about the cost of housing in our community. So, CLT and other mass production, timber production, provides a much needed boost here in Portland, but it also will obviously help the rural economy. And it present, prevents, presents an opportunity to showcase Oregon's ability to sustainably manage and harvest forests in a way such that everyone benefits. We cannot talk about buildings like Framework or about CLT without also talking about the future of this industry. And I want to dwell just for a moment on sustainable harvesting. If we want to keep our forests healthy, and I know everybody in this room absolutely does, it's one of the main reasons we're here, then it's essential to sustainably manage them. And as new technologies like CLT come online, we're going to see more and more conversations about sustainable har harvesting methods used in the production of CLT. And I want to be very clear, uh, framework has not been without controversy in Portland. There was the cost, 
because it is a new technology, there will be an overall cost that will be greater than a conventional steel and concrete building. And there is the question that environmentalists will continually to rightly ask, which is, okay, if you're saying this is an environmentally sustainable construction project, where are you getting the wood? And how do you know that it is responsibly grown and harvested? So you're gonna see more and more conversations about sustainable harvesting methods. Shifting gears slightly, we had a massive fire in Oregon this last summer, and it made headlines around the world. Some of you may remember the fire in the Columbia River Gorge scenic area. It was a massive fire that threatened to destroy the entire scenic area, which by the way happens to be one of the top tourist attractions in the state of Oregon. The Eagle Creek fire burned almost 49,000 acres and it took three months to contain it. The fire was horrific in terms of the families displaced and the lives threatened, but it also served as a reminder to all of us in Oregon and Washington about the importance of land to all of us. We've fallen in love with our forests in this state through hiking, through biking, through camping. When people talk about why they move to Portland or why they move to Oregon, they often mention the proximity to the forests as the number one reason that they chose to locate here in the state of Oregon. So this is another reason why we have to double down on technologies like the framework building. Obama administration secretary of agriculture Tom Vilsack said of the building, by embracing the benefits of wood as a sustainable building material, these demonstration projects, like Framework, have the ability to help change the face of our communities, mitigate climate change, and support jobs in rural America. I want to pause here for just one moment. This isn't just another building material. This has the opportunity, as Secretary Vilsack said, to helping us solve some of our community's key challenges around development, around sustainability, around climate change, around employment in rural parts of America. That's what's at stake here. That's what you've come here to discuss. It's not about this material versus that material. You're here, if I could sort of use a cheesy analogy, you're like my grandfather and you've pulled over to the curb and you're looking at the community and you're saying, wow, how can I use the resources and the innovation and the technology that I've got to fix this and this and this and this? That's what's at stake here. And that's why this conference continues to grow every year. And that's why the kinds of people who attend this conference continue to get broader and more diverse in terms of their areas of expertise and their connections to the timber industry and these new innovations. There's no surprise that Framework has received a whole litany of prizes and awards and recognitions. I won't go through all of them, but as diverse as the U.S. Tall, building, uh, tall Wood Building Prize, the Architects Newspaper Best of Design uh, in Research, uh, a Lafarge Holcomb Foundation Prize for Sustainable Design, uh, funding from Home Forward, which is a, an affordable housing group, Memorial, Meyer Memorial Trust, which is a foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the United States Forest Service, our Metro Regional Government, uh, Harburton Foundation, Edwards Mother Earth Foundation, the Oregon Community Foundation, and the list goes on for another half a page. It's captured the imagination of nearly everyone. It's easy to understand the excitement of CLT in Oregon, given our historical identification with the timber industry and the challenges faced by the industry and our desire to be both economically vibrant and environmentally sustainable. So in conclusion, here's what I want to say. 
The challenges are significant, but I have never stood on a stage at any forest products related conference in my 12-ish years in elected life. I have never stood on a stage with higher hopes and expectations about the future of the timber industry. I want to welcome you again to Portland, Oregon. I hope you do have a chance to get out of the building and enjoy the coffee, enjoy the donuts, enjoy our arts and culture and our restaurant scene. And I also hope you dedicate yourself to wrestling with the fundamental challenges and opportunities in this industry. Your work is going to help our economy, it's going to help our communities, and it's going to help our families. Your work is going to provide a concrete example of a path to move us all forward. Thank you for being here, and thank you for having me this morning. Thank you. So, Mayor Ted is a stud, man. He is awesome. I mean, it takes that political will and background backed in environmental science to really move us forward. And, you know, the Forest Service and the Softwood Lumber Board and uh, Think Wood and just all these partners stepping up to bring us together as an organization and a community of mass timber has really taken us to the next level. I've got the pleasure to, to bring in a Missoula person to, to introduce our next speaker. Nicole Miller is just one of uh, a very good friend. We've known each other for years. She does incredible work with a company called Biomimicry 3.8. If you haven't seen some of their work, you're going to hear a little bit more about it at the ending panel. This ending panel is going to rock the place. Nicole brings together a tremendous amount of information and really cool technological breakthroughs that are derived from 3.8 million years of nature. And but she's going to bring up, and uh, she's known Bill for a lot of years, so I'm going to bring up Nicole to introduce our next keynote speaker. So thanks, and welcome, Nicole. It's, um, it's my pleasure to, to be here with you today. Um, Craig and Arnie have continued to tell me about this conference over the past several years, and um, I'm so thrilled that it, it was able to work this year, that I was able to be here and, and really talk about some of the work that, that we're doing. Um, it is my pleasure to be introducing Bill Browning as the uh, keynote speaker here this morning. Um, Bill has really been a leading force in the green building movement and biophilic design. And biophilic design, this notion of, of bringing nature into our building spaces, has been really gaining popularity over the past decade. But it's Bill and his work uh, with biophilic design and his work with you know, Fortune 500 companies, um, NGOs, governments, cities, it, this work that has really been the force behind biophilic design being named a top trend for 2017 and 2018 by the architecture and design community. My firm has had the pleasure of working with Bill on some kind of forward-thinking projects to apply this thinking that our buildings can perform at the same level as the forest next door. This notion that, that we can gain building performance metrics that are derived from the forest next door and that our buildings can perform at the same level and produce ecosystem services at the same level as the forest next door. This vision that our buildings and our cities are producing ecosystem services on par with the forests that surround us 
is, is really what we think is true sustainability, right? When our buildings and our cities function this way, when they're functionally un indistinguishable from the forest next door, we've reached true sustainability. Bill's gonna talk a little bit about this work um, in, his, in his talk this morning, as well as some of the trends and, and work that he's been driving with biophilic design. Um, Bill is a founding member of the, of the USGBC Board of Directors, and when you look at his resume of the boards that he serves on, it's really a, a who's who uh, in, in the industry and who is in organizations that have made a profound impact on green building and sustainable design. Bill continues to push the envelope with his work on what is possible, and in fact, today we'll be sharing a really exciting announcement with us about um, a, a current project that he has started. So please help me in welcome Bill Browning to the stage. Good morning. Okay, we're gonna start with a quiz. You probably didn't expect you were gonna have a quiz this morning. You have to show your hands up. When you go on vacation, how many folks go to the beach? Okay, how many folks go to the ocean? Yeah, okay. How many folks go to the mountains? Yeah, how many folks go to the forest? How many folks go to your office? That's a legitimate question. Where do we spend the vast majority of our time? But what do we get when we go to those incredible environments? We get restored, we get refreshed, we recreate, recreation, recreate. So fundamentally what biophilia is about is trying to figure out what are the key points of those experiences? How does that impact me, not just psychologically, but physiologically? And I can measure that in all kinds of different ways. Heart rate, blood pressure, even cortisol, stress hormone. So let's bring those qualities into the built environment. Um, so Terrapin's a little research and consulting firm. Uh, we work in several different fields, um, two of which we're going to talk about today. One is biophilia, and another is large-scale biomimicry. But first, let's talk about the biophilia stuff. Why is it we look at certain spaces and go, ooh, that's beautiful, right? Can't you just imagine sitting in that room with that view and that experience? or even sometimes an office building, right? I mean, look at this space and go, that's really beautiful. It's a raw, unfurnished office space. How often do you sort of have that reaction to a raw, unfinished office space? You look at this space and go, I could be there. So fundamentally, what's underneath that response is this concept of biophilia. So the term comes from the social psychologist Eric Fromm, uh, but it really didn't get any traction until a book written by uh, Ed Wilson at Harvard, E.O. Wilson, the biologist at Harvard, called The Biophilia Hypothesis. And so this is the working definition that you typically see uh, for biophilia. And there's gaining and gaining science coming out of healthcare, coming out of neuroscience, coming out of environmental psychology that looks at how this impacts people physiologically and psychologically. And so the, um, the work, a lot of the work in the United States started in hospitals looking at healing rates of patients who had a view to nature. And what they found, and not spectacular landscapes, literally a view of brick wall versus a view of some trees and shrubs, and they found that those patients got out of the hospital faster, took far fewer painkillers, and had far fewer nursing calls. 
So that leads to the whole healing garden movement and hospital design. In Japan, it's called Shinya Niroko, literally forest bathing, taking people out for walks in the forest and looking not just at their heart rate and their blood pressure, but taking a spit sample from them because in your saliva, you can measure very readily, very quickly, cortisol level. And, and your cortisol level is a really, really good indicator of how stressed you are. And so they take people out for a walk in the forest or a walk on a busy urban street, and they measure the differential. <clears throat> and no surprise, when they get done for that walk, there's a significant difference between the experience on that urban street and the experience in that forest. For us, what's most intriguing, though, is that that carries over. When you come back to your office after you've been in that natural environment, your cortisol level stays down for multiple hours after that fix or that exposure to that natural environment. But what we're finding is that the, um, all these different experiences and all this different science kind of leads to three different categories or three sort of big buckets of how you can parse out these experiences into design of buildings and spaces. The first is nature in the space. And so these are direct experiences of nature in the built environment. The second are natural analogs. And that's what we're gonna focus a lot on today. Natural analogs are the use of natural materials, biomorphic forms, and fractals and complex ordered systems. And those lead to some really, really interesting responses in the brain. And then the third um, is the nature of the space. And these are the three-dimensional spatial characteristics of, a, of an experience. So within all of this, um, how many folks are architects here? Or home builders? Okay, so in the design and construction industry, there's a long tradition of what are called pattern languages. Um, they've been, pattern languages have been used in, particularly in home building, since the late 1700s. And so we developed from the science a pattern language of them. You don't have to memorize them. I've got cards for folks. Uh, you can take home or you can go to our website and download uh, publications on these. But we're gonna look at a couple of these today that are particularly important where wood plays a major role. And that's in material connection to nature. So there's a branch of neuroscience called visual preferencing. And it's literally looking at what are things that we look at and why do we prefer looking at some stuff than, than other stuff. And one of the things that we've learned really interesting in work by Beauchamp and others is that without us thinking, the brain looks at something, say something moving, and says, that's alive and that's a machine. And it processes those two things in a very different, different place. And it does it sometimes with materials as well. So it may be one of those reasons why you see that beautiful flower arrangement, and you walk up and you touch it, and you discover that it's plastic, and you go, <gasps> Because the brain has already told you that's alive, and you got faked out, and you don't like that. Now, wood is particularly intriguing because we're not quite sure why there's such a strong preference for wood. When we've talked to some neuroscientists, particularly some uh, guy named uh, a friend of ours, Ed Vessel at NYU, is doing some work around this. Ed says we don't know, quite know why people like wood so much. It may be one of two things. First is what the neuroscientists and the semantics call semantic content. I see wood, and the brain goes, wood, tree, alive. Therefore, it's alive, so that's good. We like that. It might be that, or it might be another impact that's actually equally in, uh, intriguing, and that is something that the brain does in processing fractals. So fractals are self-repeating patterns at scale. Classic examples are snowflakes, right? Boom, boom, boom. Or think about the bracts on a fern, right? That's the same shape that repeats at multiple scales within that. 
Wood grain does that as well. But it's intriguing because it also isn't the same every time. And so if I have a surface full of a bunch of pieces of wood, they're similar, but no two are ever exactly alike. And the brain finds that fascinating. It elicits a really strong dopamine response in the brain. It's a pleasure response. We like looking at wood. Now, to give you another example of fractals that we get fascinated by, what will you do in your living room on a cold winter night? What will you stare at for hours? Right? What are you seeing? You're seeing these little dancing fractals of various scales, and they're moving around. Now, there's no rational reason why I should spend hours staring at a fireplace. But when you watch what's going on in the brain, as one of our friends, uh, neuroscientist friends says, you're sucker punched. All these little pleasure centers in the brain are going, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. It's a really strong response. And so wood is one of those materials, some stone elicits that response as well. But in terms of material, wood elicits that response more than anything else. But there are other things that benefits that we get from wood as well. Um, you know, we tend to, particularly as a designer, myself, um, researcher, but most of our sensory processing capacity in the brain, about 80% of it is devoted to vision. So we tend to default to what does it look like. But we've got a bunch of other senses, actually more than just five senses. We've got a bunch of others, propitiation, spatial orientation, thermal. So wood does something that's really interesting, particularly when you get into the whole research around thermal perception. The way that wood as a surface feels, both haptically, particularly when we feel, can, can feel the grain in it and all of that, is really, really different. It elicits if I can get touch and vision together, if I can even, you know, some woods, I can smell the wood, right? The Japanese love using hanoki. And it's interesting because the scents coming out of hanoki actually change the uh, immune system response. And that's some of the work that's coming out of Japan and the forest bathing and out of research in Korea is looking at how the experience and the smell of the wood impacts your immune response in a very beneficial way. So wood allows us to get at these other things, and one of these is allesthesia, is the perception and comfort both spatially across the body and in time. Wood also has that fractal characteristic, and so it elicits this response in the complexity and order. Um, you see the beautiful wood grains, and it gives you a complexity and order that's really nice, but not too much. Because complexity and order is a bit like the Goldilocks pattern. Um, and so a good example of that is, here's a, uh, what's called a fractal gasket. You see one, two, three iterations of that. When I get to that third iteration, that's sort of the preferred one. If I take that to the fourth or fifth iteration, now it's getting a little too confusing. So it's really kind of a Goldilocks thing. Now what you'll see in traditional and ancient architecture, particularly rendered in wood, uh, worldwide, in, particularly in religious architectures, you tend to see third order fractals all over the place. Unfortunately, in modern architecture, we rarely get beyond the first order fractal. So it's one of the reasons why a lot of people have a sort of innate response to a lot of modern architecture and just find it boring. And that's because in the brain's response, when it's only first order fractals or not even first order fractals all over the place, the brain looks at it and goes, ugh, where's the excitement there, right? So it may be one of the reasons why uh, buildings like this, which are beautiful wood structures rife with third order fractals, we find gorgeous and fascinating. So let's give an example why this might be important. Let's think about a million square foot building 
filled with, over the course of the year, several million really stressed out people, right? And let's think of a building that's the gateway for a city and should really be representing the key experiences of this place. And let's think of a building that needs to be reconstructed because, quite frankly, some of the original core structure is not going to do too well in a Richter 9 earthquake. And we've got lots of people going through it, but all those people have different experiences, right? There's not just one traveler type going through that building. These are eight different ones. And you'll see that their experience of how they come to the place, how they check in, how they deal with their bags, how they go through security screening, how they get their time before they get to the gatehouse. And so the shaded areas and where you see the hash marks are where those folks are experiencing their most stress. And so that can turn into a three-dimensional, uh, excuse me, a planned version of a map that says, here's where those people are stressed. And so maybe I might want to think about what I use in the design to do interventions to alleviate their stress in this new building. And maybe one of the ways I do that is using a really interesting material that's very local. So another context for thinking about that, though, is um, what's the impact of using those materials? I could do that structure out of concrete, like the existing structure. I could do it out of steel. I could do it out of mass timber. So let's look at some of the implications of it. And this is an emerging way of thinking about um, how do we deal with buildings that's sort of beyond lead and some of these other ratings. And it's asking some fundamental questions about place. And so I'll start this story with, a, uh, with two things. One is a project that happened a few blocks away from here that was done by the city of Portland and Methuen and it's called Lloyd Crossing Study. And it was a study asking this really simple question of, could, as this precinct gets built out, could it move to a carbon balance and a water balance similar to what it was when it was intact forest? That helped inspire us in this project of dealing with this uh, behemoth in New York City. This is the Empire State Building laying on its side. It's the same volume as the Empire State Building, built at the same time. It was built by the Port Authority of New York as a warehousing and sorting building to get trucks and trains off the streets. And so trucks and trains came into this building. The trucks were put on elevators the size of my apartment. <laughs> and four of those that moved up and down through the building, and then the trucks drove around inside the building. Uh, made deliveries, and then got on another elevator and were taken down out of the building. So that activity ended in the 1980s. A client of ours bought this building. It also happened, and it was in, at that time, Chelsea was a pretty nasty place, but it happened to also be where fiber came into Manhattan. And so they put 16 different data centers, almost a million square feet of data centers into this building, and each one had their own independent systems, and you can kind of see that represented on the roof. That roof, the wedding cake roof, is the museum of mechanical systems. Every possible way of cooling and mechanical systems is demonstrated on that roof. And our client came to us and said, we've got several issues we want you to look at. The first is data centers want to expand, and there's no more space on the roof to do that for cooling systems. Two. We have the biggest energy bill in New York, $53 million of electricity a year. I think we might want to do something about that. And third, there's kind of this weird thing going on with our water. We buy 51 million gallons of water a year, and we put 90 million gallons of water into the sewer. And we know kind of something about basic physics that doesn't quite Math on that doesn't quite work. 
So we've been doing work with the Wildlife Conservation Society uh, in a project called Manhattan, which is a remapping of New, of New York back to the ecosystems at the point of European contact. And so you can type in your address and find out what the ecosystem on that site was. And what we discovered through that process was this was a forest with a stream originating in the middle of our site. And those three sump pumps in the lowest portion of the building that are pumping all the time, that are pumping this clean, beautiful, fresh water into the sewer, 45 million gallons of water a year, and have been doing that for 80 years, maybe that's a resource we ought to be thinking about. And let's also ask, what was that forest for us doing at the time? And so we developed a whole set of metrics based on what that site was doing when it was intact in, in 1609. Um, and that forest was sequestering 3.7 tons of carbon a year. Today, that site is emitting 85,000 tons a year. While we were in the middle of this process, one of the tenants in the building bought the building, handed a check to our friends for $1.8 billion, came to us and said, we like aspirational standards. Saving 30% of the energy in this building is not googly. We want to go from 85,000 tons to 3.7 tons a year. That's our goal. Now, we don't know how we're going to get there, but that has opened up conversations and ways of thinking about the building um, that are really very different. Now, to take that um, in a slightly different way of getting at that same thing, a number of years ago in a conversation between Ray An our friend Ray Anderson, who founded a carpet company called Interface Carpet, it's the biggest manufacturer of carpet tiles in the world, was having a conversation with Janine Benyus, um, the founder of Nicole's organization, and he asked this question, he said, you know, here's a company that's product is made from petroleum. I said, could my factories perform as well as the forest here? And so that led to this concept of factory as a forest. And it led to a concept of then going in and saying, let's look at a reference ecosystem where this place is, and ask what it's doing. What are the ecosystem services that it is providing? So these are some of those services that this local ecosystem provides. And they fall into five big categories. And from those, we can actually through the research, particularly the research that the team at B3.8 is doing as part of this, is develop a set of numbers and translate those numbers into equivalency for the built environment. And use those numbers then as a set of guideposts for long-term thinking about how we do construction, how we do operations on these facilities. So it's not just getting to net zero energy, it's thinking about what's the fabric of the building itself. And as I'm expanding these buildings, and as I'm thinking about operations, what am I making them out? Because it's not just about sequestering product carbon into my carpet tiles and lowering carbon in my operations and that, it's how I fundamentally build. And so we see other folks doing this. this you know, I'm sure everyone here knows this building, T3. It's a great example, but they've done some really great uh, process in doing measurements around that. So if I were going to build a really large building here and make it out of a local material, it would become really important to get it right. 
And so this is some fantastic work that part of this design team has been doing. Uh, so the design team is uh, led by ZGF. Uh, this is work by Arup uh, and looking at what are the carbon implications of doing a structure that is 400 feet by 1,000 feet and making it out of different materials. Now, what you will see is that we are definitely better than steel and concrete. But here's where we gotta get it right. If we do it in the old fashion and we do it as business as usable, we still have a carbon footprint. It's less than concrete and steel, but we still have a carbon footprint. If we get it right, if we do it locally, if we sustainably harvest it, we wind up with a structure that has a, potentially has a negative carbon footprint for its lifetime. That's really revolutionary. That's really important. That's the potential of what we all have here together an opportunity to do. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Bill. So hats off to the committee and the FBN team, um, but really thankful for Bill to, to come aboard. I mean, we're trying to look at some things differently. Our panels are filled with, a, filled with a lot of really awesome things going forward. We got a couple other things that we're gonna share with you here just to get you thinking, to challenge you to come together as a community. You heard Mayor Ted, you heard this incredible project that's gonna happen here locally with, uh, that's really big and really cool. Um, we had a, a great visitor last year and we're gonna bring a little piece of them. So Bruce, if you don't mind coming on up. Bruce Ward has uh, been dedicated to the environment for his entire career. He's done a lot of really awesome things. He's gonna once again talk about our friend Chuck Lavelle, who's a huge supporter of Mass Timber and the forest products. But with that, welcome Bruce Ward. Thanks Arnie, it really is an honor to be here. An incredible lineup, an incredible conference. Um, Craig, Arnie, uh, Tom, you guys are doing an awesome job. So another pop quiz, how many of you know who, who Chuck Lavelle is? How many of you know uh, the Allman Brothers, Rolling Stones? So that's Chuck. Chuck is a keyboardist for the Rolling Stones, the Allman Brothers, Eric Clapton. Um, and that's how a lot of people know him. But that's not how I know him. Um, I know him because of his passion for the outdoors. I know him because of his passion around sustainable forestry. And I know that like many of us, there's a concern, and I think that the mayor did a good job of articulating this evolution of thought about how at one time Portland, you know, was the center of environmental opposition to the timber industry. And, and actually coming here, I had heard that there was gonna be a demonstration, and I kinda had this vision of what those, you know, newsreels were like. And then when we got here, there was this really, friendly guy calling himself the Lorax and um, he essentially greeted me and you know I told him I was coming in here and there was not the same kind of antagonism or animosity. I think this industry has come a long way in demonstrating the importance of the utilization of wood and in many respects has overcome a lot of those uh, issues. So I've been running nonprofit organizations primarily conservation recreation for the last 25 years so my supporters have been the North Face, REI, Coleman, companies like that. And now as I look around this room, a lot of the supporters you know, that I have, it's everybody from um, Wagen Brothers, Russ Wagen's been a supporter for a long time. 
Uh, Freyers have recently come on as a supporter of one of our initiatives where we bring a 80-foot Christmas tree. It'll come from the Willamette this year to Washington, D.C. And we'll um, set it up on the west lawn of the Capitol and we'll talk about the importance of timber and, and, uh, and about our forests and about recreation on our forests. And, you know, there, there are so many others. Uh, the, the Softwood Lumber Board has been a big supporter. A Sierra Pacific really came on recently as a, uh, a supporter. We've been working with the North American Forest Partnership. Will's doing an awesome job bringing the industry together. So what I'd like to do is show a, a brief clip from uh, Chuck. He would have loved to have been here, and he told me, Bruce, I'd be, but Mick called, and um, I'm going to Europe, and playing with a band. So this was kind of a hard choice for him uh, to not be here today, but uh, Jeremy, if you could just roll that clip real quick of uh, Chuck Lavelle, I'd appreciate it. Hi guys, Chuck Lavelle here. I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person at this year's Mass Timber Conference, but I certainly enjoyed my experience last year giving a keynote to the group. Hey, I just want to say thank you to all of you that have supported our television program, America's Forests. Uh, I think most of you know that we've had two episodes run on select PBS stations now, and we are determined to get that full series, and we will with your help. So, please put us up on your social media, uh, put us on your websites, call your local PBS stations and request that they run the program. And if we all do that, we're going to make it happen because we feel that this is absolutely the best way to get the real story of wood usage and sustainable forestry out to everyone. Thank you so much and have fun out there. So there's Chuck, and you really couldn't have a more um, passionate individual who has a very different take on this industry, you know, similar to myself. I came to this, you know, I'll call it the rest of the story. The men, many of you remember Paul Harvey. He used to talk about the rest of the story. So how does this come about? A guy who spends his life in outdoor recreation, hooking up with a guy like Chuck LaBelle and putting together a TV series. You know, for me, it became very apparent. I live in Colorado, and I had been evacuated from my house three times. I lived in that wildland urban interface. I had been, you know, subjected to the mountain pine beetle epidemic from the standpoint that I couldn't go camp where I like to go or hike where I like to go because of all this massive insect infestation. And I was back in Washington, D.C. with the Undersecretary of Agriculture, Harris Sherman, at the time, and he was from Colorado. There was a little bit of a Colorado Mafia back in D.C. in the Obama administration. And, and, you know, he said, Bruce, I appreciate what you're doing on the recreation front, but what we really need is a greater involvement by the, uh, you know, by industry in dealing with this and also helping to create a better understanding in the general public of what we're faced with. You know, it wasn't just dead trees and I couldn't go hiking. It had water. There were water quality issues. There were issues associated with these catastrophic wildfires. And I started to go to meetings with a lot of the timber industry folks and government officials and members of the environmental community. And it became very apparent to me that it's the work that you're all doing, the work that you're doing to promote the utilization of wood and sustainable forestry that will help us deal with these issues. And it, it, it's something that, you know, in all honesty, my friends, my tribe, as we refer to it, say, Bruce, you sold out to the timber industry. And I said, no, you don't get it. Without their help, without the support of all of you, you know, we won't have places to recreate. And I talk about the unintended consequences of well-intentioned environmental policies that have created a lot of the concerns that we now have. And I think now more than ever, the work that's going on with CLT can help to, you know, create that understanding of the connection between sustainability and the utilization of wood. So we've done two episodes to date. The first one was in Oregon and we featured Thomas Robinson and, and the building that was going on here. We went out and visited you know, the, the, uh, the site that he was working on. We went to DR Johnson, worked with Valerie and John Redfield there to get an understanding of how that all came together. And then we actually went out to where there was harvesting going on and you could see 
the uh, sequence of, of growth and how the, that forest was coming back to life. We did another segment down in Bend where we visited an area that there had been some thinning that was going on to prevent the city of Bend from a catastrophic wildfire. But they worked with the mountain biking community, which I thought was brilliant. So they put in some great mountain biking trails. And we had, in one of our segments, Chuck is actually riding a mountain bike with lumber trucks going by in the background and talking about this kind of connectivity. And then the last segment we did in Oregon, we actually had um, someone who was part of that Timber Wars and was an environmentalist. And he's kayaking through a beautifully restored watershed that had been accomplished because of collaboration with the timber industry. So we, we were able to demonstrate the good things that are happening on our forests. And then we recently just finished one in Colorado. And in Colorado, we did three segments. We did a segment on what we called from forest to faucet. We did that with the support of Denver Water. And we had Chuck up on the Continental Divide and brought that water right down into the city and had some youth doing uh, you know, water quality testing. And then we did another segment on the in interesting uses of beetle kill wood. We had Chuck doing a uh, jam section with people with be beetle kill guitars and beetle kill drums. And they were doing it in a recording studio that had been preserved in the middle of a catastrophic wildfire. So that piece came to us. And then we did another segment on the therapeutic values of our forest. And we brought, uh, we brought Chuck to a project called Project Healing Waters, where we were bringing re returning veterans and helping them to you know, reestablish their lives here through the therapeutic value of, of being in the woods. So we envision several more of these coming up. We just got uh, the accreditation from the National Educational Television Association. So this will be up on, this can be put up on all 360 PBS stations around the country. We're looking for great stories. I know there's a million of them. Um, Steve Marshall has probably given me about 50 um, just since I've been here. So thank you very much for having us and greatly appreciate your, your time. So, you know, it, it really comes at us at a lot of, a lot of different angles. We've got uh, a final presenter and then a couple of prizes to give away. But um, Will, Will's going to come up and um, talk about this ending panel that we're having today that I really encourage you to come. I know it's at the end of the day at 3.30. It'll be, it'll be worth it. But we're going to give a little taste of what that's about. So if Will, if you would come on up at... Um, Hashtag well done. Forest Proud. So here comes Will. Welcome. Thank you, Ari. All right, it's going to be a little technical changeover so we can show you the good stuff. Um, Mick Jagger called me too. <laughs> I said, Sorry, Mick, I'm going to Craig's conference. It's, it's more important. So uh, raise your hands if you like a challenge. Okay, and, and we're in the Mass Timber Conference. I would expect every hand in the room to go up because uh, I think you're in, you're in a, a challenging phase of what you want to do. So I want to talk to you about two challenges today. One is a significant one, and it's what uh, Forest Proud, the North American Forest Partnership, is all about. And, and so that's a pretty big challenge. I think that's like a five, ten year ongoing challenge for everybody in this room, actually. I think you're all involved in that challenge. And then I have a challenge for everybody in this room again, which is this afternoon, when you really want to just, you know, go and drink some of that great beer, uh, you're completely jacked on three days of caffeine, uh, or you're trying to run to the airport and you know it's getting late, we have the graveyard session, right? So. So Craig called me and said, I have a, as part of your big challenge, I have a small challenge for you. How can you run a session at the end of this workshop where 1,100 people from 20 different countries who really just want to go and drink together or do whatever they want to do are going to stay and listen to you and a fantastic panel of people? And uh, so I, I scratched my head for a while and I said, okay, well, let's think about that. What, what session would keep everybody here? So, so now I'm going to sell you this session in various different ways uh, using my English accent and, and my wit, hopefully, right? 
And Craig always talks about this accent, Arnie does too. Uh, when I took on the North American Forest Partnership, I had a full head of hair and a Texan accent. Right? <laughs> and, and now I'm bald and something's happened to my voice. So I don't know how this, I don't know how this all happened. All I know is that if you try and align the forest sector, you're gonna lose some hair in the process, but I think it's doable, okay? So, why would you come to the session this afternoon? I think there's a couple of reasons that you'll come. First of all, you're gonna hear more from Nicole, and I want every guy in the room to recognize that what we've already introduced Nicole as having is 3.8 million, it is million or billion, right? See, billion years of intelligence over every guy in the room, right? <laughs> Evolution has brought you Nicole, and she will be in the session this afternoon. But the other reason I think you should come is this. Everyone in this room, I'm pretty sure, has either a strategic plan or a Gantt chart or a sales number that they're trying to hit or the number of buildings that they want to build as part of their architect firm or a priority about how much carbon is going to come out of all of these different things. You all have goals, okay? Raise your hand if you don't have goals because I want to be you, right? I know I, know I have goals. <laughs> I have goals I have to hit. This sector loves metrics. They literally sit down with me like, okay, if I put dollars into the North American Forest Partnership, how many board feet are gonna, I'm like, okay, it's not exactly that kind of role, okay? But you all have goals. Here's what I wanted to tell you. I believe in terms of mass timber, in terms of everyone in this room who's concerned about mass timber, if you wanna shorten the time it's gonna take to reach those goals, you should come to the session this afternoon. If you want to sell more mass timber than you're planning to sell, you should come to the session this afternoon. If you're an architect and you're kind of tired of sitting in rooms and explaining to people why mass timber is the best thing since sliced bread for buildings, you should come to the session this afternoon. Because if we don't align as a sector and we don't align around the story that is mass timber, in the next five to 10 years, if we don't align and tell that story together and get our story straight, it's gonna take way longer to do everything that you wanna do. It's gonna be way harder to do everything that you wanna do. And there are people out there, there are voices out there who are already aligning, are already coming together and saying, we don't like the sound of this mass timber thing for whatever reasons. They could be competitors, they could be really extreme about the environment, they have their reasons, right? And they're looking at this sector and saying, these guys haven't yet aligned and got their story together. They're leaving a vacuum in terms of telling the story of who they are. We can jump into that vacuum and tell a different story. Right? So we have a choice. We can either get on the chessboard right now, ahead of, the, ahead of the game, really, I think, and tell a great story that you have to tell, or we can let other people jump into that vacuum and do whatever it is they want to do and as anyone who works in communications or branding or marketing or this kind of strategy knows, reframing an issue is a hell of a lot more expensive and hard to do than telling the story in the first place, right? So, as I said a year ago, um, a group of people got in touch with me and said, we're doing this thing called the North American Forest Partnership. We, we think uh, Michael Gergen, is Michael here? Somewhere here, there's Michael. I'd done some work with Michael when he's with the Society of American Foresters. I'd done from work from SFI, and I'd spent 20 years working with sort of multi-stakeholder groups to align them and tell their story. And I'd done that with Michael, and he said, I think you should take a look at this thing called the North American Forest Partnership, okay? So I had my full head of hair, Texan accent. I can't do a Texan accent. I said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll take a look at it. Um, so I said, I'll come and take a look at this. Let's look at this as whether this would be a, a good gig to try and do. And, and what would the challenges be? Now what I can tell you is over 20 years of doing these kind of strategies where you're pulling together groups of stakeholders, often non-profits, foundations, but also for-profits, people like Intel, Department of Defense, Easter Seals, World Wildlife Fund, just this wide range of issues. Every time you walk into a room for one of those potential clients, they tell you a couple of things. And, and it's very consistent. They say stuff like, you know, you can't dumb down our story, it's too complicated. Okay? And they say stuff like, we have so many people pulling in so many different directions, there's no way you're ever gonna get them on the same page. It's like herding cats, right? And they say stuff like, actually our stuff is so nuanced that you really can't sort of tell one message about it. 
And if you try, you're going to be telling someone else's version, not my version of it. And this just goes on and on. And it's this long list of excuses of why it is hard to tell a great story in an aligned way about a sector. And so I've said that to every one of them over the years. And when Michael called me and said, talked about that and started laying out some of the challenges, um, I listened carefully and said, yeah, but this is totally doable. Now, all I want to tell you is a year into this task, while every other sector has claimed that they are more complex, more nuanced, more, more divisive, more competitive than everybody else, you are those people, right? <laughs> you are the folks that actually, you're the holy grail of brand strategy. If we can do this, I will have achieved my lifetime goal of taking on you know, this really tough job of how do you align people and bring it behind. Now, but when I looked at this job, and I listened to everybody I knew that I talked to a lot of different people in the sector, leaders from across the sector before I interviewed for this position. Um, I was listening. You, you, when you listen as a brand strategist, what you're listening for is, is there something there that is true and authentic that we can take and make the core of a really powerful story, a really powerful message? Okay, so I'm starting to listen, and these are the things that I heard. First of all, Forests touch every part of your life. Okay? I don't think there's anyone in North America who doesn't get up and get through a day without being impacted by forests, almost on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Okay? So that was your first tick off. Yeah, maybe this is worth looking at. The second one, and I actually think this is probably the single most important one, is forests already and can continue to solve really big societal challenges. All sorts of challenges that we're dealing with. And we've mentioned a whole bunch of them already today. How do we deal with the urban-rural divide? How do we deal with rural unemployment? How do we deal with wildfire? How do we deal with climate change? How do we deal with all this long list of things that we see in the news every day and we know people are truly worried about and should be? Well, forests can solve a whole bunch of them if we get our, get our job right. The solutions are rooted in forest management. Right? And, and what we know, what I know from all the research we've done at the North American Forest Partnership and all the research I've seen, is that when you basically ask the general public about forests or trees, they have two things in their head. One is Bambi running through kind of a Disneyland gorgeous environment, and the other is a clear cut. Right? Those are the two ends of the spectrum that they think about. But in between those two is the world that we all know is out there and the, the forest that we're managing, this spectrum of forests managed to meet different benefits and objectives. And that's forest management. So the solutions are rooted in forest management. And if we can start to tell that story, uh, I believe we can take people a very long way and really build the trust and support we need for the sector. And then what we want to tell them is that requires a lot of people. It's all the people in this room. It's all the people in this sector, this community. They need to be trusted to do their part, to play their role. And quite frankly, what we also know is right now you're not. And I think um, Bruce was absolutely right to say we're way more trusted than we were. But all of your jobs and every job in this sector becomes a whole lot easier if we can build the trust and the support that we need and actually tell the story of who we are. Okay, so I believe our job is to keep forests as forests. You all know why that's true, but there's an audience out there beyond the sector that needs to hear that story. So what's the journey we need to take those audiences on? We, well, we really need to go from defending to defining. Okay? And I've spent a lot of times in rooms in the last year where people talk about, oh, I'm not defensive, we're not defending the sector. And then everything that comes out of their mouth for the next 10 minutes sounds awfully like defending to me. Right, so there's all this kind of code within the sector for like, no, no, we're not defensive, we don't. And then you hear the speech, and the speech is really, you know, all the, all the nonprofits do is care about money, or they, all they do is spread misinformation. And I'm just hearing this messaging over and over again. And what it's basically saying is we're going to play a defensive game. Okay? I don't think we should be defending this sector. I think we should be defining who we are and telling those positive stories and getting them out there. That's only really going to happen effectively if we, if we go from being splintered about that story to being aligned about it. North American Forest Partnership now has about 110 members, and that includes everybody, to play with the spectrum a minute, from you know, Weyerhaeuser, Hancock, 
the US Forest Service through to the Nature Conservancy, Sustainable Northwest, it's this broad spectrum, this broad diverse spectrum, all coming together to align behind telling the story of who we really are. I think that diversity is a challenge, but I think it's incredibly powerful because it gives us a credible voice to speak from and an amazing network to get the message out. So we want to go from this kind of Paul Bunyan image, which is how people out in the public, you know, everybody, there's a few plaid shirts in this room, but basically, you know, people walking past here think everyone in here is wearing a plaid shirt. Um, so how do we go from that image that we have to be being seen as responsible, innovative stewards? That's the identity that we deserve and the identity that we need. How do we go from this cutting trees business to the fact that we're addressing societal challenges? So how do we tell that forest management story? It's really about a whole set of diverse forests instead of one. And what we know, and I think this is the worst piece of misinformation out there in terms of North American forests, is that people believe deforestation is a huge problem in North America. If you look at the research, it's a very, very high numbers in terms of that belief, uh, when really we're doing an incredible job keeping our forests as forests. So what's the best tool that we have available to do that? And it's already come up this morning in various contexts, but it's telling stories, right? And telling the whole story of the sector instead of this very narrow story. And why are stories so important? And, and some of you came to the hashtag Forest Proud North American Forest Partnership event that was here in Portland um, in November. And we did a number of sessions looking at storytelling and why storytelling is so important. Um, but what I know is that if you work in board feet or you think, you know, think if, if an Excel spreadsheet is your best friend, you don't like this part of my speech, right? You're like, no, it's about the facts. I'm just gonna put more facts out there. And in fact, if I had a fire hose full of facts, I would point it at someone and just turn that sucker on and I really don't understand why that doesn't work, right? And you just love the facts. And I sit down with you, and you talk to me about North American Forest Partnership, and you say, in Forest Proud, you say, yeah, but I need to see the numbers, Will. I need to see those numbers. I'm like, yes, the numbers are coming. But first, we have to get the stories out there to create those numbers. Now, if you don't believe that stories are important, or you think numbers are really, really important, I want you to just think briefly about two things. If you have a spouse or a partner, did you draw up a sheet of pros and cons before you ended up with them, run a spreadsheet, now compare the answer from that spreadsheet to who you're with. That's why I'm, you know, I don't wanna go any further than that, but I don't think that happened because you ran a spreadsheet. Uh, look at the house you live in. I know you set out with a, an amount of money you were gonna spend and some choices about what that house was gonna be, and now look at where you're actually living and, and the house that you chose, right? You made emotional decisions about those two things. You made an emotional decision and then you rationalized the decision. That's what the science tells us. And there's no science going in the other direction. No one's coming out and saying people use facts to, to make decisions. We're, all the science is showing us that people use stories to understand facts and they use them to rationalize those decisions. So that's how you let the facts in. You have to tell a story. Stories are how we retain information. And most importantly for everyone in this room, if you're working in mass timber, this is what you need to understand most about stories. Stories are how humans navigate from where they are now to where they want to be, okay? You, we all, it's the only way you're gonna change anything in your life, or for your kids, or for your, whoever it is, is if you create a story in your mind of where you want to go. So this, the session this afternoon is about that. It is about what is the story that we're going to tell people that will align them behind mass timber and what are the key elements of that story? And we have a panel of great folks. Tom Robinson's there. Uh, we have uh, Nicole's gonna be there. A whole group of people to talk about what are the elements that we need to tell in that story if we're gonna tell, bring people with us. North American Forest Partnership, 110 members. I would like the 1,100 people in this room to also be members, okay? And, and what I want you to do is recognize that coming on board and joining us, whether that means just sharing the content coming out at hashtag forestproud, forestproud.org, or being a partner in the North American Forest Partnership, what we want to do is make your jobs easier, okay? Whatever it is you're selling, whatever it is you're doing, by building trust and support for the sector, by filling that, filling that vacuum, with the story of the sector and who we really are and aligning people behind that story. Every piece of marketing that you wanna do gets easier because people 
start to change their perceptions, start to change the story in the mind of who the sector is. We're doing that by targeting three audiences. Uh, the first we call ambassadors, and that is folks who have serious reach, often on social media, but not just on social media, to do a great job of telling our story. So we're identifying the top ambassadors, the top influencers that can use this content to get that story out. The second one is workforce. And our second audience workforce, there's two things we're trying to do with workforce. One is build pride, note the name, Forest Proud, build pride within the workforce so that everyone who works for you and with you can be a better ambassador for the sector. But equally importantly, we want to bring new diversity and new talent into the sector in terms of workforce. We know that for many people in this room, attracting talent is one of the biggest challenges you're going to have. Okay? And attracting talent, I think you guys are, certainly have some of the best jobs coming up in the sector. But if you want to attract millennials into working in mass timber, you are going to have to change the story in their minds about what that means, about working in this sector. The reason I'm emphasizing that is I'm going to show you a film in a second. And some of you have seen this film before and said, what's, what are you trying to do? What's the, what's the goal of this film? The goal of this film is, that, to put it in real simple terms, if you're a millennial looking at, this, looking at the sector as a potential place to work, we want to change the story in your mind. We want to create that excitement about working on the sector. And when I briefed the guys who shot and produced this film, and they said, what, how does this work? What is it you want it to do? I said, the single most important thing is if I turn the sound down and you watch it, you get a very strong sense of the excitement of the future of this sector. What you're going to see in the film is a lot of mass timber. This was not, you know, was that a deliberate choice? Absolutely. But the reason we're choosing mass timber is I think mass timber does the single, it's the best tool in our toolkit right now for telling the story of the sector. It's the best metaphor for where the sector is headed. It is the best way of getting people past this thinking about cutting down trees and to the place of recognizing this amazing connection between forests and how they make our lives better. So with that, I will just ask you, I'm going to play this and then and we'll end, I think we're ending this session, right, moving on. Um, but I'm going to play the film. I'm going to ask you to come to the session this afternoon. And I'm really going to challenge you. I started this by saying, do you like a challenge? And most people raise their hands. The challenge I want to leave you with today is this. If you don't care about communications and you think everything I said about storytelling isn't true, you still have a profound responsibility to tell the story of this sector, to help us do that. So I want you to do that by sharing our content at Forest Proud, by getting behind Bruce's project. Every single person in this can get behind uh, telling our story more effectively. Every one of you should have a shopping list that you're coming to Forest Proud with and saying, I need you to tell my story, help me do that. Um, this is the first showing of this film, so we're releasing this today to this community. I'm excited to um, hear from any of you, your feedback on it, um, and come join us at Forest Proud in the North American Forest Partnership uh, to do this job of telling our story really well. Good to see you. Hi, Thomas. Yeah. Good, good to see you, too. Yeah. Three, take one. Mark. Ah. <laughs> the place I want to start is this idea that there is almost a limitless possibility for how these materials can get used. It's a material that we have a lot of history with. And so I'm wondering if we can start by what excites you both about working with wood. Sure. Uh, you know, I, was, I was really interested to hear you talking before, Shadow, about the idea that um, you can make almost anything from forest products. It's just a question of time and will. That's one of the things that gets me really excited about using forest products. With time and pressure, we can simulate so many of these things that we have from fossil fuels. We can replace some of these more damaging materials right. and use forests to actually make something to make right. people's lives better. When I think about trees, I'm blown away with what they are as a biological organism. Wood's like the original carbon fiber, you know. It's got all the same properties and it's such a strong material to work with. The idea that we can make perfume from forest products. We can make anything from wood. Pulp and paper production. Super capacitors. Jet fuel. We're building a first high-rise building in the United States 
out of wood. As long as we're willing and open-minded to try new things with it, it's a forgiving and malleable and strong enough material to evolve with our ideas. Whenever we talk about new products or innovative products, we are facing a lot of challenges. And what is exciting to me is, is facing those challenges. You become more innovative and uh, you come up with new ideas. And the thing that is really hard, I think, for the average person is when they look at a forest, they love it. I mean, who doesn't like to go for a walk in the woods and just enjoy being in nature? It's just spiritual. But when we harvest trees, you know, unfortunately, it's not pretty for the first couple of years. And that's a tough thing for people to see. But we focus so much on that one act of cutting, and we never focus on the 50 or 80 or 100 years that it took us to grow the forest that's in the first right. place. I think more people are understanding that if you don't manage the forest in some way, it becomes a real problem. And you can sort of see that playing out in the massive forest fires that we've had happening. These forests need to sort of be managed to stay healthy. Managing that forest in a way that it's going to be there for future generations, it also has the, the least damaging environmental impact is, is important. I think in any way you can just get people to be a little more engaged in the big picture, not necessarily what they're seeing right in front of them, I think is, is a really critical aspect of being part of this space. In the United States in particular, we have about the same amount of forest today as we did about 100 years ago. We have the same amount of forest. We don't have the same amount of people. You know, our population has increased significantly. Right. That's a huge success story about what's possible by valuing forests and the products that come from them. I think everybody un understands. You, you walk out into a, a forest and you, you can feel its intrinsic value. You want to make beautiful places, you know? I mean, people deserve a little bit of beauty in their lives. When you work with any like living fiber, anything that's like been alive before, has cells, has a little more of that like warmth to it than working with any kind of like synthetic material, you know, anything that's been like synthesized, it's like you don't have quite the connection to it. Right. Students or custom board people that have emailed us like after they've taken their board home and they literally talk about how they almost feel like there's like a living being in the room when their board's in their room. It just had this feeling of like something that was alive and I just think there's something really neat about that. One of the things that gets me excited about building out of wood is that people have a, um, an innate kind of direct connection to it. So I think there is a relationship between us as human beings and this material that was also a living thing. Shabnam, from your experience, you know, you're around a lot more forest than, than you ever were before. Yes. What's that been like for you? I, I see the beauty of forest, uh, the beauty of using forestry products. So uh, I always say that when someone says, why do you think tree is important? Just look up. When you look up, you see the value of tree, and I believe uh, it's a future. This industry has been around for a long time, and the next wave for forest products is going to be one that's going to capture people's imaginations about what's possible with this incredible biology that we have. We benefit from forests in the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, uh, the enjoyment of being in nature, and what's really exciting to me, for this next generation, because we've done a good job of stewarding forests, they will have the chance to discover that forest. Thanks, everybody.